Hi there and welcome to this video. I'm going to walk you through how to uh, set up the interactive uh, visualization app um, to work with uh, particle data loaded from YT time series. Um, the interactive app is a browser based app um, built for visualizing cell tracking data, uh, but it's it works pretty well for just um, particle data as well. Uh, and um, yeah, so let's kind of dive into this. Um, I guess before we actually start looking at code and stuff, a little bit of description of what you're looking at. Um, so this is, uh, these are um, particles subselected from a particular YT sample data set, um, the ENSO64 data set. Um, and if I turn off these tracks here, you'll see just the the particles themselves from the beginning of the simulation to the final time step um, converging um, as the simulation proceeds. And then the tracking data here just shows particular paths for a subset of these particles. Um, and we can make the cells a little bit darker so we see those paths a little bit better and you can see the particles moving along the paths um, throughout the simulation. And uh, let's turn the tracks back on. So the tracks just highlight where the particle is along the that path along with both a little bit of um, the, the past trajectory uh, along the path. So you can control the length that is shown here. So if we make this really small, we'll just see the more or less the current location um, throughout the simulation. And if you make this longer, you'll see more of the path highlighted. Cool. So uh, let's uh, actually dive into getting set up to use data from IT in this. Um, yeah, so first off, uh, Interactive, um, as I said, is a browser-based uh, app. It's a TypeScript app built with React and um, uh, 3.js, uh, the repository here, Warrior Lab slash Interactive, um, we will be using. Uh, we also will be using um, uh, some uh, a notebook from this uh, repository here, so github.com slash um, data dash exp dash lab slash interactive uh, underscore yt underscore demo. Um, so before uh, you get started, you might want to pause this video and um, clone both those repositories. Uh, the um, notebook, um, I'm actually just going to walk through real quick here and um, to give you a general sense of it and um, that might be all you need. Uh, you might want to just take a look at the notebook and get a sense for how it's done and run the notebook locally and then um, you could, you'll could you be able to use the interactive app uh, directly. Um, and But in the, the rest of the video I'll actually go through and um, build up that notebook from scratch and show you how um, how it works in more detail. But so yeah, so yeah, if all you care about is getting it up and running real quick, uh, just go and take a look at the notebook, um, which you can access from this repository here. So it's this YT particles to interactive CSV um, notebook. And so the way this works uh, is it takes a YT time series. Um, So the Enzo64 sample data set, which you'll want to download from the sample data page in YT. Uh, for, so that's ytproject.org slash data. Um, and if you do find for Enzo64, um, so this is 2.4 gigs uh, data set here. So download the whole thing. Um, make sure that you do go this route. Uh, the YT load sample helper function, I don't think we'll grab all the time steps for you. We'll just grab a single time step. Um, yeah, so go down that, download this data set if you want to use the same data set that I'm using. Um, and if you want to use this notebook pretty directly. So uh, so what this notebook does, loads in that um, data set as a time series, and then essentially just loops through every time step and outputs a CSV file of particle locations um, in the format that Interactive expects. Uh, so Interactive, uh, the actual app itself uses a, a particular czar storage format for its um, track and particle data. Um, but 
they include in here this tools directory <laughs> a number of python scripts that help you actually create data in that czar format um, so the easiest thing to do is to output data in that expected csv format and then use their little converter to get it into their particular czar format um, if you want to look into this more detail in more detail and figure out the structure of the czar array you could totally skip the intermediate csv step and just write out your czar directly but um, just to get something up and running real quick this video is going to cover how to use that along with some data out from output from mit um, so yeah so so yeah uh, so we, that's i think it started so as i said you know if you want to just get started as fast as possible i'd recommend you just go and download this um, notebook and just run it um, you might have to modify one or two things um, but and the, the rest of this video though is going to walk through just uh, creating a notebook and environment from scratch to do all this um, so yeah so let's actually get started on that let's close that out and keep those open for now I will do everything totally from scratch here so I'm gonna go make a new directory here and I'm gonna clone a, both this repository up here this um, data exploration lab repository here the let's get that locally oops get clone and I'll make that folder and then I'm also gonna clone the repository for the for interactive itself um, and so I'm cloning this so that we have I can run those Python tools directly but also um, I will run the web app locally as well uh, Cool. So now we've got both our interactive repository and the interactive YT demo. Um, so let's create a new environment. Uh, so I'm going to use Conda for this. Um, you could use any environment manager. Uh, most of the work here is going to be done in Python um, to actually do all the conversions and stuff. Um, interactive requires Node.js. So if you have Conda and use Conda, it's convenient for installing Node.js as well as all the Python stuff, but um, you could just use a standard Python environment um, and then install Node.js separately if you want to run the web app locally. Um, yeah, let's call this interactive live demo and we'll grab a Python, skip 3.10. <clears throat> Activate this, and then um, we're going to go into the YT demo repository first. So in here, there's a requirements file. So this is these are the requirements for both what you need for the interactive tools, which are just the SciPy, Zar, NumPy, um, but then for the YT conversion um, step, uh, that notebook's going to use uh, you know as you would expect YT, HiPy. Um, Pandas. I don't actually think we need Pooch in here. Uh, doesn't hurt to install it, so we'll just keep that there. Um, and then also, this is going to leverage Dask uh, to speed up that time series um, processing. Okay, so let's install all those requirements. Um, I'm actually just going to use pip here uh, because this is just a one-off repository or uh, environment that I'm using in Conda, and I mostly am using Conda here just to get the Node.js access. Um, so I'm just going to install everything from pip rather than using Conda install. Okay, and then um, the, we might as well just install Node.js now as well. We're not going to need it until the very end, but um, might as well set everything up. 
Cool. Okay. So now what we are aiming to do is get our YT particle data into the expected format. So um, we're going to do this from scratch and see how it goes. So let's open up a new Jupyter Notebook, give it a name, um, get a converter, and we're going to need a bunch of packages here. So we'll need yt, we'll need numpy, we'll need dask, uh, also we'll want to import client from dask, from dask.distributed, import client. Um, we'll probably need more things that I'm not remembering. Oh, we'll want pandas. Uh, I think I'll probably use path a bit. And yeah, let's just import all those. See if that's all we need. Um, okay, so first off, uh, let's set our YT log level very high. Um, just so that we don't get too much output. When you're processing these time series, you get a lot of stuff printed to screen about building our um, reading in each um, uh, time step of the data series. Uh, so let's silence that. Um, and then let's check out our time series that we want to handle. So we're going to do yt.load enzo64 dash dd four wildcards slash data and four wildcards. And that should pick up um, all of the time steps in, oops, in our Enzo64 data set. So we have 44 time steps here. Um, we can look at the first one, um, just pulling out it, pulling it out by index, and let's uh, do make a slice plot. Normal to x, and uh, let's do gas density. Um, and the first time step's not very interesting, right? Um, it's just the initialization field that's used here. Uh, if we switch this to a more intermediate time step, you know, about halfway through, we see some um, gas density structures here in the simulation. And then uh, this is not a particle field, but uh, we can check out what particle fields are available. Um, let's check out each field uh, for field and field list if that first field is equal to IO. I think this will give us all the particle fields. Yeah. So we have all these particle fields and what we want to pull out um, for our interactive visualization are these the XYZ positions and then the particle index. Um, so the XYZ position we want to output for every time step um, along with the index. But this index will correspond to the unique track ID um, in Interactive. Um, yeah, so the, basically the, the simple goal is to just <laughs> iterate through the time steps and output uh, the index and the position for every time step. Um, many ways to do that. Uh, I'm going to walk you through how I did it um, using uh, Dask to speed up the time step processing. Um, but, but yeah. You can do it any way you want, really, uh, as long as it gets into the final form. And in terms of the final form we need, if you go check out the interactive um, uh, repository readme file uh, down in here, there's this section on visualizing your own tra cell tracking data. Um, so this is the CSV structure that is expected by the tools in here that'll take the, the CSV file and transform it to their um, sparse czar data format that they're using. Uh, so what we're going to do is use our particle index um, particle ID as this track ID field. Uh, I'm just going to use an integer time step numbers um, to, for the time variable and then XYZ are the actual positions and those get rescaled within the, the um, um, actually I think within the app not within the tools. Uh, Python part. But in any case, uh, we'll just output XYZ in code length units um, and then the parent track ID. So this is if you had particles that were merging or splitting and you had multiple tracks or originating from a single track. Um, but in this case, I'm actually going to set everything to minus one just to 
uh, keep things simple here, uh, just so that we have independent paths. Um, and then uh, just as a side note, I'm not going to use this because I'm pulling out the particle data from an Enzo simulation, but um, there is a, the option to add a radius column here. So you might be able to get this working with some of the SPH particles as well, uh, which I haven't tried yet. But uh, yeah, so let's actually do this. So what we're going to do is write a series of functions um, that'll process the single time step and then uh, write a dask delayed operation to process all the time steps, run it, get a whole bunch of CSVs, and then merge those CSVs into a single CSV and give that to interactive. So let's give it a go. Um, and as I said, you know, I have a working notebook uh, that you can go take a look at in this um, interactive YT demo uh, repository. Um, you know, I'm going to be basically recreating this notebook, uh, but probably different function names and stuff because I won't remember everything that I've done. So, first off, let's let's uh, write just kind of an outline of what we want here. So, um, we want a kind of an overall function that's going to process a single time step. Um, and this is what we're going to use give to a dask delayed call uh, so first argument we're going to have a ds name um, time step id uh, and then a save directory uh, so with dask um, when you use delayed when you delay a function, the arguments to that function will um, get serialized to be communicated to the different processes. And so uh, passing it um, uh, the name, the file name of the data set corresponding to its time step is much better than trying to pass it an instantiated YT data set, just because the uh, pickling and unpickling YT data sets is um, not super stable all the time. Uh, you can get weird stuff happening. So, and since in this case, we're processing each time step independently. It's just a lot easier to just pass in a file name. Um, yeah, so what do we want to do? So we're going to want to load in our actual time step individually. Um, then we're going to want a step for extracting particle data positions. And then we're going to want to save the data. So let's write a function to extract that particle data. So extract particle data. So for this, we will pass it our instantiated data set. Um, and we will want to pull out the XYZ fields here. I'll just make a list of all the fields we want to extract and then the particle index as well. Um, and because we want these uh, fields to map to the expected uh, format for the interactive um, app here. Uh, we're going to rename our column or our, our field names now because um, we're going to be using pandas to write these to, to CSV. So uh, let's just do a rename right here um, as we're reading the data. So for each of these, we will have an entry. Um, you know, let's just do this by field name. Particle index is going to map to track ID position Z, just Z, and position Y, just a Y, X to X. And then, um, so we're going to start this off by actually just extracting all the particle data. <laughs> because it's fun to do, um, but we'll come back and modify it later to extract a smaller amount. Um, so for each of these, actually, so we'll have a 
particle data dictionary that we're going to pass back from this function. And then for each of these field fields in the fields array that we want, um, we will dict so map the field name. So this will remap the position x, y, z to x, y, z, and then the index to track ID in for the dictionary keys um, that we're going to pass out. And we'll read all of the data and just read that field directly, and then return that. Um, then down in this process time step, we'll want to do data that extract particle data function. Um, so let's just double check we got all that working. Um, so we do currently have a data set loaded. So let's just say data extract particle data DS. Make sure we get out what we expect. Cool. So we have XYZ and track ID. Um, right. So one thing that we can do, uh, it's a little bit cleaner if we um, um, pull out or uh, convert these track IDs to integers here. Um, so let's do it as type uh, mp.int 64 for that. Um, let's also drop the unit arrays too. So. Uh, we'll add a dot d here to just pull out the underlying f value. Um, cool. Now we play numpy arrays and then we have track ID. Um, now we want to write a function to save some data. So def save to CSV. Uh, so for this, we'll want a time step ID and a save directory for spot to save it um, and but we don't want to actually pass in our data set here we want to pass in our particle data um, so first off we're gonna make a data frame out of this um, so data frame p data and then let's construct a save name here from our time step ID and we'll say uh, Oh, let's see, let's call it time underscore time step ID dot CSV. And let's put it in our save directory. So um, I'm assuming here that I'm going to pass in save directory as a path object. So we can just add a backslash here. Um, and then let's write our CSV. Uh, so we'll write it to save name. Uh, and we do not want to write the index here because we don't need it. Um, don't really care about the format. Otherwise, formatting, we can use a comma here. So let's just keep it like that. Um, and let's actually call it save to CSV P data. And let's try it out. So let's say. So um, <clears throat> this is how you can pull out the file name corresponding to the current to a current time step. So uh, let's try process time step um, actually before I do that, uh, let's actually make a save directory. Save directory, let's say path, let's call it. Article CSV. And let's actually make that directory. Um, and actually, if save dir is directory, it's not a directory, let's make it um, just put it in there. So if we run this notebook again, we'll be okay. Um, cool. And then let's attempt this process time step call. Uh, so let's say process time step. 
um, ts, let's go 22, let's give it the file name, give it the index we're working on, and that's our save directory. And let's see. It loads in and mess something up. Two CSV is missing. Right, forgot to give it the arguments. T step. Cool, so let's just go take a look at what we got in there. Um, so we have our one CSV file and it should just look like a standard CSV. So X, Y, Z, track ID, cool, all good. And so it works, let's remove it. Cool, so now what we want to do is just run this for every time step. Um, so you could just write a loop, um, but you know that took how long? Uh, three seconds, we got 44 um, time steps. So, you know, that's a couple minutes of waiting around uh, and we can speed things up significantly using Dask here since it's a pretty simple um, uh, operation. Um, and we're gonna, so you could just uh, start up a Dask or go through with a Dask call, it'll initialize your, a client um, on its own, but I like to initialize it myself since I know what I'm working with here on the machine. Um, and also because these are totally independent processes where we're, treat, where we're tackling each um, time step independently, uh, it does actually end up being thread safe. Uh, so I, you can actually use multiple threads on this too. Um, Let's spin that up. Uh, oh, interesting. Oh, unexpected keyword. Uh, threads per worker. And didn't actually shut down the old one. Um, you know, I'm just gonna restart everything, run everything again. Just get that task worker clean. Okay, cool. So, we've got our task client. Um, and because the requirements had bokeh in there, you can hit that uh, little um, dashboard link here and pull up tasks, nice little interactive dashboard. You can see all the time steps being processed as it happens. Um, Okay, so to create our parallel process here, let's first pull out the name of all the file names that we want. Um, so uh, file name for ts in ts. Make sure that makes sense, yeah. Cool. Okay, um, and then we will, um, oh, you know what, before we do this, we're gonna make one modification to our process time step. Um, let's return something from this. So let's return particle data uh, track ID size, um, just so we know how many particles we're pulling in at each time step. Um, cool, and right. So, uh, so let's make an empty list and then for f name in, for t step id comma f name in enumerate f names. Um, we are going to want to append a delayed process. Task.delayed. Uh, so we're going to call our process time step and give it our functions. So we have our uh, particular file name for the current time step. We have the time step ID in the sequence and then we have our safe directory that we're using. Uh, 
and that'll be almost instantaneous and you can check out uh, how we now have a bunch of delayed processes that we'll send off to our DAS cluster in a second. Um, I did just realize though that uh, so in our save to CSV function. So this converted our data frame here. We do also need to actually <laughs> set some of the other columns. So the other two columns that we need um, are the time and the parent track ID. Uh, so parent track ID, um, we're gonna set to uh, just one for everything or minus one. And then the time we're gonna set to the time step ID. So this will just be an integer time that reflects the time step. Uh, so let's run that cell again and then come down to our processed and rebuild our delayed processes. Okay. Cool. So now let's actually compute this. So let's say processed is equal to dask.compute and give it all those uh, delayed actions here and let's set it loose. And oh, okay, so we are still getting the log output here. Um, I'm gonna actually kill that. Uh, yeah, probably easiest to actually stop the kernel here. Um, so sometimes with Dask, uh, the, the YT config does not um, transfer to all the workers here, so uh, we're gonna set the log level up. Set log level to 50 up in this process time step as well. Um, okay, now I think we will just restart the kernel here and run down to here. Run and all above. <clears throat> okay, now let's actually run that again. Uh, let's build up our delayed functions and then run them. And now you can see, you still get the index building um, log information from YT, but it's much less output. Uh, and you can see all of the, um, all the jobs running on your little Dask cluster. And we are done in 10 seconds or I guess a minute. Anyway, okay. So now we have <coughs> in our CSV directory, um, we have a whole bunch of time step files that are all about 18 megabytes or so. Um, so now what we need to do is take each one of these and create, and, uh, create a single CSV that contains all that data. Um, again, many ways to do this. Uh, I'm going to do it manually here because um, it's not too bad. Uh, so let's, we're actually done with Dask at this point. So I'm going to close up that client there. And then let's see. So what we need to do is iterate through all of those files um, in our save directory. So let's OS for this. So for file name in lister uh, saveder, um, let's add a couple checks here. So if, if name, let's actually go back up here before loops, output file name equals all the data.csv. So if, as we're writing, we're going to be dynamically appending to this file, so we want to make sure that we're not actually reading it in accidentally um, if we run, rerun this or something. Um, so if that condition is met, we're going to skip to the next iteration of the loop, or if, oops, or not, uh, if name ends with 
CSV. Uh, so just in case we end up with we end up with other file types in this directory, you want to skip those. So we're only going to be pulling in the CSV files. Um, cool. So for each one, we want to load it in with pandas. And then um, we're going to write to output file name. Don't want the index in here. And then uh, we're going to use a couple extra things here. So header is equal to, we're going to write some variables for this. So write header. And then the uh, writing mode also are going to vary. So initially, this is going to be write mode is equal to write. So this will just create a new file on the first iteration. And then header is also going to be initially true. So the header will get written. And then immediately after we write our first, we're going to switch these off. So we'll no longer have the header file being written and our mode will switch to append. Um, and and then since we won't need all those intermediate CSVs anymore, let's create a list and remove them. Well, you know, I suppose we could just remove them right here. Um, so we've processed it. Uh, uh, saved or plus file f name. Yep, I'm going to run this once without removing them just to make sure it works before I actually remove the data. And let's just make a list here. Before I go removing things. <laughs> okay, let's run that. Um, oh, 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 great. So we need to actually give it the directory here too. And Typo here, oh, right header. Oh, and we want right mode as well. Okay. So now we run that, and we should. Eventually, we will end up with a single CSV file. like we're writing in the wrong directory, but that's okay, I'll let it run. And they're up to 286 megabytes. I think this will end up, end up being like a gigabyte or two. Um, so it's kind of a big file to have as an intermediate file, but uh, we'll just wait it out. And uh, for the next run through, we're going to actually put it in the directory that I wanted in, but let's not worry about it right now. OK, all done. Uh, 771 megabytes. Not too bad. Um, so let's move that into the directory that I did want it in. Um, and when we run this again, after modifying everything, it'll end up there. Um, and then we also have our files to remove. Cool. So for file in files to remove, uh, let's just do this because I'm paranoid and remove each one. So we'll only be left with our one big one. But we got cool. So now we have our single CSV file, and X, Y, Z track ID, parent track ID, and time as we need. Um, so we'll do one more thing before we actually run the interactive tools. Um, so let's just sort our um, CSV by track. Uh, beforehand. Um, so let's read that in. Let's 
is oops. We're gonna read in our output file name, which didn't actually rerun that yet, so we'll have to do that. Um, and then sort values by uh, track ID. And let's write that back out. If to CSV, oops. Output file name again. Uh, don't need our index here. Let's do that. Okay, I'll let that run, get the next part set up. Um, so at this point, we've, we'll have our CSV file. Um, so from here, we need to use uh, some of the other tools from the interactive repository. So let's go take a look at what those are. So we're gonna go back up to the interact the full interactive repository um, and let's take a look at what we've got in here. Okay, so we're looking at this in VS Code here. Um, so we have a structure of just a standard uh, TypeScript app. Um, so we have uh, all of the config files up here. Um, package.json describes all of the dependencies that you need to, to build and run locally. Um, some scripts we can run that we'll use later. Uh, and then the source is where all the TypeScript components live. Um, and all the other stuff that make up the, the web app browser front end for this. But so all, all we care about right now though is this tools folder. So this tools folder has some Python scripts. So this convert tracks CSV to sparse, we'll take that CSV we just built and create a czar file uh, using some czar sparse arrays with a diff couple different um, sub arrays. Uh, and that is what the app will actually read in. Um, and then we also will be using this serve directory HTTP to give the web app access to the czar file we, we just created. So let's actually go ahead and use those things. Um, and do I remember what I named this? Yes, okay. So activating my environment again. Um, Let's go into our tools directory and just run python convert tracks dash dash help. Um, so you see, we got to give it a CSV file. So this is the original CSV file and then an output directory to uh, store it. In. So let's give it a file that we just created. Uh, so we'll go back to our notebook, print out our output file name. Um, so this is I want a full path here. Okay, absolute. Is that it? There we go. So we'll give it our full path. And so that's the CSV file we want to um, process. And then let's actually put it in the same directory and then hit enter. And we'll get some outputs. Um, and this will take a little while to run because uh, we exported all of our data. Okay, and we're back. So we should now see in our data directory here, we have an all the data underscore bundle dot czar. So that's our czar data. Um, and you can actually go in here and look at the structure. So these are all arrays that get output um, to help with the how uh, interactive loads in particles and paths. Um, uh, but yeah, it's just a czar data set. Um, so now in order to actually view this, what we gotta do is um, run a little file, a file server. Um, serve directory HTTP, HTTP help. Uh, so you just gotta give a directory you wanna um, 
serve. So let's do that. Um, and so for this, you want to actually give it the the czar. Uh, underscore bundle dot czar. Um, since the czar structure is just a directory here, that's what we want to actually serve. Um, so let's do that. And so it should tell you it's live at this address, and you open it up, you know, you get your little file server. server. Great. So let's leave that run in, open up a new terminal here, um, and let's get our interactive set up. Uh, so let's activate our environment again. Uh, so this is the one step that uh, does not need Python, but it does need um, Node.js. So we already installed it here. Um, if you haven't installed it, uh, you know, do a conda install Node.js. If you're not using conda, there's a bunch of ways to install Node.js. Check, just check out the Node.js um, uh, install site. Um, but yeah, uh, so let's do that. So all npm install from the top level of the interactive um, uh, repository. We'll just go and fetch all the dependencies needed. Um, and after doing that, you should, should see this node modules director, directory where all those dependencies will live. Uh, and then npm run dev will activate one of the scripts that's in the package config here. Hit that address, open it up in the browser, and you should get your instance of Interactive. Um, and it'll come preloaded with a um, pointing to a remote data set up on the uh, Biohub here, the CZI Biohub. Or, um, and so all we need to do is just change this address that we're loaded. So you down here in this globe, hit that button, um, and we want to use HTTP 127.01 port 8000, hit apply, and you should get this crazy image. So we have all of our data. So you see all these crazy lines here? Um, so we are actually just looking at the grid structure initially. So the initial, initially the particles are li aligned with the grid coordinates, essentially. Um, so if you zoom in, you start to see the individual particles here. Um, and we can change time steps with the slider down here. Uh, so as we go, you start to see things kind of fall into the expected um, network that forms in these simulations. Um, hit the play button. Uh, you see it's pretty laggy because it's got to load in that particle data for every time step, um, but using the slider is pretty responsive. Um, and I actually forget how many particles. You know what, let's go back to our notebook, which is still running here. So after we ran that, Dask operation, uh, we were storing the outputs. Yeah, so we have our, the number of cells loaded in each type separate here. So let's just plot that up. Oops. Matplotlib.py plot is plt. There we go. <laughs> cool. So we start off with like just over 262,000 and end up with about 10,000 more. Um, so each time step, it's got to load in 260 to 270,000 particles. Um, so being able to click through like this is actually pretty impressive. Um, cool. So the other very cool thing that interactive does is highlight actual trajectories. So because each of these particles has an associated path through it throughout this time series, um, you can select a particle and it will highlight that path. So that's, um, so with this much data, it's kind of hard uh, to see what happens on the interior. Um, we'll do another example soon that is a little bit easier to see, but let's just like zoom into the edge of this. Oops, I already did it. Let's clear those cells. Okay, that's confusing. Um, let's try to 
grab some on the edge here and see what happens. Also don't want to grab too many. Um, cool, so what we're seeing are actually kind of edge effects. Uh, where the particles are going across the, I guess, periodic boundary here. Um, so that's not very insightful. Uh, let's go to one of the final time steps and oops, we can pull out, drop that cell size. Um, so in playing around with this, I often will end up with these warnings about um, have taking a long time to load. Uh, I found that if on my computer, at least if if this is uh, below a thousand, um, it's not too bad. Cool. So that's starting to look a little interesting. Um, so you can see we selected some cells in one of the higher density kind of parts of the network here that's starting to form. And so what you're looking at here, um, let's drop the cell brightness here so we're mostly seeing the tracks. Um, <clears throat> let's turn off the highlights. So just the tracks, the little pink dots are the current position of those particles along that track. So if we go all the way back to the beginning, you can see where all the particles are that end up in that location, as well as the paths they take to get there. Um, we still have some that are going across this periodic boundary here, so that's a little confusing, but uh, you can see all of these in this section of the grid end up being pulled into this area. Um, <clears throat> and then if we turn on the track highlights, this just highlights for the current time stuff you're on. It highlights the um, both a bit in the future and past of along the, the streamline. Um, so you can get some pretty cool visual effects with this um, and a pretty cool sense of like motion along the trajectory. Uh, and if you change this down here, so you set this to zero, uh, you won't get any. If you set it to a very small amount, you'll just get a, like a little um, kind of fireflies moving in towards the middle. Um, if you highlight the whole frame, things get kind of crazy. But yeah, cool. So um, one of the tricky parts of this is the selection of particles. So let's clear this. Uh, so let's say we wanted to actually select something in, in the middle or farther in. Um, the easiest way I've to do this is using this adjustable sphere here. So this will plop something right in the middle. Um, and uh, so you can move this little selection object around um, in a number of ways. So uh, when it's highlighted, if you hit the, so the little panel down here on the left shows you how to control this thing. Um, but if you hit W, you can modify the position and you can drag it along any of the axes. Um, so, Currently we're just kind of sitting in one of the void spaces. Uh, so let's try to get over to a higher density region. Uh, let's go down a bit. Well, that's actually pretty good. Um, so you can see in yellow the cells that would be highlighted. Um, so if you just, if you wanted to go ahead and select those, you could hit uh, shift and click. Um, and we're up at around 1478 new particles or cells. Um, so that's a bit high. Um, let's zoom in here. Don't actually want to load those in. Um, so the other uh, way to control these is the, the radius of the sphere. So if you, while you're hovering over it, if you hit um, R, you can change the scale. So you can actually stretch it along any of the axes. So if you wanted a more elliptical shape, you could do that. If you highlight, if you, um, if you put your cursor over the center position, highlight and click and start dragging, you can um, change it symmetrically about all of them. Uh, so that just lowered it and we're down to 500 cells. So let's try to load those in. Cool. So 
Uh, and when you're hovering over this, over this thing, if you hit S, it'll make it disappear. Also, let's turn off the axes here. Um, and let's turn the brightness down again. So that cool. So now we can just see the tracks. Um, still have uh, some occlusion from some of the other particles. Um, that are out there, so depending on your orientation, it can be hard to see. But um, yeah, in the next example, we'll modify that a little bit. Uh, cool. So let's actually walk through this. Yeah. And so cool. And so you can see for this particular region, all these um, different particles being pulled into that particular high density region. Um, and if we turn the cells back on, you can see it happening in the interior there. Um, cool, but it'd be nice to be able to do all this, uh, you know, without being occluded by all the, all the other cells here, um, or particles <laughs> in our case. Uh, so we're gonna go and modify our Jupyter notebook to, uh, to actually not just export the whole domain here. Uh, we'll just export a, a subset that's of interest to us so we can get a clearer picture of what's happening in the interior. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and close Interactive. Um, no longer need to be serving our data. Uh, let's close that anyway. Um, and let's go back to our notebook. Uh, so. Go way back up to the top um, and let's actually restart this just to clear everything out. Um, and yeah, so let's instead of looking at the middle time step, time step let's look at a slice through uh, that last time step. Um, So this is through the middle of domain. Um, there's a couple of high density regions here, right? Um, let's pick a position manually. Let's say, and so we're gonna center a sphere around this position. Um, so this is gonna be at, let's make a plain NumPy array first. So this will be 0.5 um, in code length. Uh, and then we're looking at, um, let's change this to a native origin. So that's about 50 MPA in Y and 75 in Z. So let's go 50, oh, M MPC, sorry. Uh, 50 MPC and 75. MPC um, to these two we want to convert to code length. And then so select radius. So let's select like um, 2.1. Radius of 0.1 is what we're going to use for our sphere. Um, okay, so we're going to do two things. So, so we could just, you know, uh, go down to our extract particle data function that we're using in, in the Dask process. And instead of the cs.r, um, we're going to select from a sphere object. So let's first create that sphere using this position array. Uh, actually, let's actually make a unit array here and connect it to our data set that we've loaded. Um, and then our select radius. Um, and now, instead of ds.r, we'll use our sphere selection. And so if we just reran all this, we would then just get 
everything within that sphere every time step. Um, <clears throat> uh, I actually think that it's, it's kind of interesting to do this a little differently. So, so we will use this sphere um, initially up here too. So let's do that. Um, and then we have our particle index field. So these would be all the index values that end up in um, in that sphere at that final time step. And uh, so, so we're going to do two things in our selection. So we want to follow all these particles that end up within a sphere around here throughout the whole sequence, whether or not they originated, um, whether or not they're always in that sphere. So what we're going to do is save this um, particle index within a new data frame. Track ID P index. And then what we can do is that each time step that gets loaded in, we can join against this data frame and then only get the, the tracks that end up in here. So we'll discard anything that does not end up in there. Um, and yeah, it's cool. So that's good to use. So um, in order to do that, so in our extract particle data, we're still going to use this sphere um, and uh, select from it. But we're going to just make the radius much bigger. So we're going to increase that by a factor of, um, let's go a factor of five. Just so that we don't have to then join against the entire particle data set um, every, for every step. Um, so what we'll get out is a more limited number of particles. And then down the save to CSV where we have our, uh, we create our data frame that we want to um, save. Uh, we're going to merge. So we're going to merge on df and df index. We're going to do inner join and by track ID. So all we'll get are the tracks that end up in that sphere at the end. Um, one extra note. So by putting this within this workflow that Dask is going to use, um, Dask will end up serializing this df index and sending it to every process. Um, so this does have potential for not scaling super well if, um, uh, depending on how big this is. So it's only 3,000 rows or so, so it's not too bad. Um, but if you had a much larger sphere, larger number of particles in this sphere, um, this might slow things down and you might have to uh, instead um, send this up to individual processes in a better way. But in any case, we're just going to put it right in our um, workflow here. Uh, and oh, you know, I've, I've been having a bug with the current Jupyter version here, uh, where sometimes my cells disappear. <laughs> Jupyter was, just had a release, and so I think uh, something funky has been happening. Um, so I'm actually going to real quick go and install a slightly older version of Jupyter Lab. Currently have 4.3.1. Jupyter Lab. I think that just the previous version fixes this. So. Cool. Okay. And so we're back to our notebook where we've added our sphere subset and then we're doing our join against the track IDs that end up in that final sphere. Um, and I think we can delete that test there. Um, let's run down to here. Now, um, put 
Yeah, we're good to still run this, not overwrite. Um, so now we'll be writing out all the time steps for again. Um, bo, 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 oh. Unexpected keyword argument. That join should have been, I think, on and not by. Try that again. Okay, now we're good. Um, and you can see all of our CSVs populating. So we'll let that run. Uh, and let's update the, so we're still gonna have to concatenate all those arrays. So we'll do a data subset. So we'll call our new file name data subset. Um, ba, ba, ba. Actually, before we do that, let me save that and call, okay. Data subset csv and then down here we also don't want to read in our old all the data so we'll add that too um you can see that dask process ran a lot faster too because uh there's less data to write and most of the time in this process is um writing to disk but in any case uh so now we can go ahead and merge all of our CSVs, skipping the existing all the data and the existing czar directory here. Let's run that. Um, need an actual equality there and not second equals. And now we should have our data subset. That's a lot, a lot quicker to rewrite and concatenate. Um, we can remove all the old ones. And then we're gonna read in again and sort by index. And we now have our new file here. Um, might as well see what we got for particles. Um, so we do still increase in number of particles over time. Um, that may be because some of the particles that end up in that sphere start from farther out than that initial sphere subset we're using in our desk. Um, initial calling up here with that uh, that sphere. But in any case, we'll still get something interesting. So now we have our new file, which now we have to go process again. So in the tools here, we have our Python convert tracks. Cool, so we'll give it the new file. Um, still wanna call it or store it in the same output directory. And you can see that runs a lot faster, uh, much fewer tracks. And then we want to serve the data subset bundled czar directory. And, okay, cool. So let's uh, spin up our interactive app again, open it up, and load in our new data. Cool, so now you can see that we have a kind of spherical subset. Um, the reason why it's not an exact sphere is because we started off with an uh, a true sphere selection of the final time step. And so not, you know, these are all starting on a rectilinear grid. And so what you get out initially is not uh, spherical. But all of these particles end up in that sphere, uh, which is kind of cool. Way to look at things um, and the you can see that watching the time series here is much easier because there's fewer uh, particles um, so it's much more responsive and let's turn off those axes yeah so let's go ahead and select some tracks again uh, so let's select some of the outer ones first uh, so we're in our box selection so we can just um, oops shift and click to select some particles here. Uh, so that just picks up 11 of them. Um, let's turn on Cool. So you can watch those outer particles move much more clearly because we're not occluded by all the data in the domain um, or in the data set. And again, we can go in and um, select some data centered on one of these high density regions. Um, might be able to get lucky and uh, 
Oops. Might be able to get lucky and not have to do the the full manual sphere selection. Um, okay. Or are we low? Let's see. Okay, 123. That's not too bad. Cool. And now we have a lot more to look at here. Um, let's drop the cell size so that we can focus on the paths. Drop the brightness a little bit. Um, let's see what that looks like. Cool. So yeah, that's all I had. Um, I hope you found this useful. Uh, thanks for watching. Bye.